our lecture today it will be about transverse arch discrepancy so let's start first with the definition of the transverse arch discrepancy so first we call it cross bite which basically the discrepancy in the buccolingual relationship of the upper and lower teeth as we can see in the photographs now the definition and the classification will usually take the lower arch into consideration so for this one the lower arch is the reference so this one called the buccal cross bite while this one here because the lower teeth are including lingual to the upper teeth we call it a uh, lingual crossbite whenever we have a crossbite it's very important to diagnose whether or not we have displacement which basically that the patient have a discrepancy between the um, um, retruded contact position and the maximum intercuspation so if you see in the top photograph here the patient is biting cusp to cusp but he's not feeling comfortable for that reason the mandible is trying out the patient is trying to achieve maximum intercuspation so the patient will shift his jaw to either to the right or to the left or sometimes anteriorly to achieve maximum intercuspation when the patient is biting here we call this is the centric relationship while this one is a maximum intercuspation usually the patient should have the centric relation and the maximum intercuspation in the same there's no discrepancy between them but because of the deflective contact and the premature contact, the patient when he's biting, he can't achieve maximum intercuspation on the centric relation, so he will displace the mandible. And that's why we call it discrepancy between the centric relation and centric occlusion. This video can help to, to, to um, explain it, as you can see, patient bite cusp to cusp, and then he shifted the mandible to the other side. So what is the etiology of the crossbite? Now, uh, we went in this lecture to understand the crossbite, the transverse discrepancy, and then to decide the management for this crossbite. And it's always important to understand what is the cause of the problem, and then you decide what is your treatment for that problem. So let's go and see what are the different causes of crossbite. So the first one, as usual, is the skeletal factor. So, as you can see in this photograph, patient like this will have crossbite, and one of the most obvious factor and causes is a narrow maxilla. As you can see, the maxilla is narrow relative to the mandible, or could be that the mandible is too big for the maxilla. So it's either that the maxilla is a small in size, mesodistally, or like sorry, and between right and left, or that the mandible is uh, big. But however, whenever we have a crossbite, we need to distinguish whether the cause of this crossbite is dental or skeletal. So how can we distinguish? Because the management is different. So if you have a crossbite that is dental in origin, then all you need to do is just expansion. Just, I mean, dental expansion. Well, if you have a skeletal crossbite, you need to do skeletal expansion. So how to diagnose them? If you look at the top one here, you can see that the palatal vault is big while the teeth inclination is palatally inclined these are called dental crossbite while the one in the bottom here you can see the narrow palatal vault and you can see that the teeth are flared in order to compensate for the crossbite and here i just want to explain it if you have a patient with a class 2 so the upper incisors will try to compensate by being retroclined. The lower incisors will be compensating by proclination, so the overjet will be reduced. This dentoalveolar compensation take place in the anterior posterior dimension. And the same happen in the transverse dimension. So the upper teeth will try to compensate for the underlying skeletal discrepancy by being flared buccally. And the lower molar as well will try to flare lingually as well. While in the dental cross spite, you can see the opposite, that the palatal vault is big, but the teeth are flared palatally. So in this case here, simply, if you just need to correct this cross bite, dental expansion will get these teeth back into normal inclination and correct the cross bite. But if the teeth, if we have a skeletal cross bite and the teeth already flared, Further e expansion would make them even flared more. So in these cases, we needed skeletal expansion. 
So if you can look at this patient here, you can see that she has a crossbite and it's a bilateral crossbite. So I was saying, okay, let's go and do expansion. This is a narrow maxilla. Well, if you examine it carefully, you can see that this is not a narrow maxilla. This is a wide maxilla. So why this patient has a crossbite? Because she's a class three. And whenever a patient has a class three, we have something we call it anterior posterior discrepancy. What does that mean? If you look to the uh, photograph here, the black color is the upper arch, while the purple or the pink color is the lower arch. As you can see, that the arches are wider posteriorly than anteriorly. So if the patient has a class three, let's move the jaw forward, the lower jaw forward. So I am moving the wider part of the mandible forward, which is gonna occlude with the narrower part of the maxilla. So we're gonna have a crossbite. So here, the etiology for the crossbite is the discrepancy, the anterior posterior discrepancy, not the narrow maxilla. It's skeletal, yeah, but the cause is the discrepancy, the anterior posterior discrepancy. For that reason, Haas in 1961, he had two terminology to classify the maxillary deficiency. He said the first one, we call it relative transverse discrepancy, which basically it's due to the anterior posterior position of the mandible. It's relative. And the other one is absolute discrepancy, with which in maxilla is narrow. So how to diagnose that? Simply hold the study models in a class one canine relationship. That will eliminate any anterior posterior discrepancy between the maxilla and the mandible. After that, if you still have a crossbite, which means that the crossbite is due to narrow maxilla. While if you have, if you put patients into class one, everything is fine, there's no crossbite, that means that the crossbite that we have is relative. So what are the clinical features that we expect to see in a patient with transverse maxillary deficiency? Definitely because the maxilla is narrow, we're going to have an upper arch crowding. And the more severe, the narrower the maxilla, the more crowding we are expecting. We might have a unilateral or bilateral crossbite and could be associated with or without displacement as you can see here. The buccal teeth are usually flared because they are trying to compensate for the skeletal discrepancy. Uh, usually the palate is narrow and the palatal vault is high as you can see so it's narrow and high and it's maxilla it will be in v-shape as well and because we have a smaller maxilla we're expecting uh, more impacted teeth especially the canine and the, when the patient smile will have a wide uh, buccal corridor excessive buccal corridor the last etiology of the skeletal etiology, if the patient has an asymmetry, and um, that's what we're going to ex uh, ex um, explain at the next lecture, uh, whenever a patient has hemimandibular elongation or condylar hyperplasia, as you can see here, the mandible is shifted to one side, resulted in a crossbite. And that's management uh, of this one will be discussed in the next lecture, uh, but not for this lecture. So now we said about, th we mentioned three causes of crossbite, a uh, skeletal one. We said narrow maxilla, it could be a bigger mandible, or uh, anterior posterior discrepancy, or a mandibular asymmetry. Soft tissue can play a role as well in the etiology. As you can see, if a patient have a thumb sucking habit, um, the tongue will be dropped down, the cheeks will um, force um, the two, um, the buccal segments in the upper, uh, into the palatal direction and we will have a um, unilateral crossbite with displacement. Um, local factor, simply if the teeth erupted in upright or more palatal position, as you can see here, yeah, it's a, it's a V-shape, but the, the maxilla is, is big, it's not too small. And you can see here, you can see the mucosa on the um, buccal side of the premolar, which means that the teeth are tipped palatally. So this tipping palatally, that could be due to the path of eruption, the position of the tooth germ, uh, or crowding sometimes. If you have a premature loss of the uh, E, the six will move forward and uh, there's no enough space for the five to erupt, that will result in a crossbite. These ones are easy to manage because simply all we need to do is just ex dental expansion. It will be corrected. 
as you can see here we have a scissor bite the cause of this one is an ectopic tooth bud as you can see the seven a tooth bud was here uh, sometimes as is mentioned before crowding so if the five has no space to erupt it might go erupted palatally and resulted in a crossbite so now that we have um, these are the crossbites we said that we have buccally crossbite and lingually crossbite in you now the etiology for these different crossbites just a quick revision for uh, the classification the first one is when you have unilateral buccal crossbite with displacement so you can see here it's buccal the lower buccal cusp occlude buccal to the upper teeth and patient is biting cusp to cusp then he's shifting the mandible to one side so we call this one unilateral buccal posterior crossbite with displacement uh, sometimes we have a crossbite but it's not associated with displacement like this one here it's just localized crossbite and there's no displacement so you call this one unilateral buccal crossbite without displacement as this one as well here it's only on one side there's no displacement call it unilateral buccal crossbite with displacement crossbite can be bilateral and as you can see here it's the buccal cusp uh, in the lower so we call it um, bilateral buccal crossbite I'm sorry, yeah, it's called bilateral buccal crossbite. It could be, as we mentioned, see here, it's a lingual crossbite. The lower cusp is lingual to the upper teeth, and it's only on one side. You can tune the lower, lateral lingual crossbite. Could be involving one tooth or more than that. Or it could be bilateral lingual crossbite. Um, as we finish now, uh, the classification of and the etiology of the crossbite, before moving to the management, I just want to explain two things. The first one is that it's very important that we don't compare the patient and the maxillary width of the patient to the normal population because that's not how it works. Because some people, they have wider cheeks, they have wider zygoma, they need a wider teeth. So what you need to do when you examine the patient, you don't need to look for a number to um, see if the patient will look, for example, measure the intermolar width and see that this has a narrow maxilla or not. What you need to do is to compare the mag intermolar width for this patient with the zygomatic width for the same patient. The other thing is, if a patient has a narrow maxilla and narrow mandible and normal occlusion, that does not necessarily indicate that you need to do expansion and, and the reason for that because you're just doing unnecessary treatment with high risk of relapse that the teeth might relapse and the patient might have a crossbite with displacement so w whenever you just see a patient who has a narrow maxilla narrow mandible there's normal occlusion there's no crossbite that does not mean necessarily that we have to do expansion for this patient. The other thing that I want to discuss before we starting management is just to know what is going to happen normally with the arch width during age. And we base our knowledge mostly from Bishara's study in 1997, in which he said from the age six weeks to two years, there will be a significant increase in the intermolar and intercanine width. That's very significant. Then from 3 to 13, we will have an increase as well in the intercanine intermolar width until the eruption of the permanent teeth. Now, once the permanent teeth has erupted, the intercanine width mainly, and especially in the upper, there will be reduction, while the intermolar width, they kind of like, they have reduction, but just a little bit. However, the intermolar width in the upper and lower will still going uh, growing from age 7 till 18 not like the intercanine width which is stopped basically after the eruption of the lower canine and then after that it will slightly reduced while about the mid palatal growth it sees by the age of 17. so from here we can see the intermolar width expansion at the intermolar width um, is a little bit more stable because it already increased till the age of 18 while the intercanine width is stopped by the eruption of the lower canine and then it starts to be reduced. So now, as we finished all the etiology and all the classification and all these comments, we are ready to go and do with the management. What shall we do when we have a crossbite or a transverse maxillary deficiency that needs treatment? 
the way I divided this um, section now is according to the patient age so we're gonna go through them as a primary and early mixed dentition late mixed dentition early permanent dentition and then which is early adolescent and then late adolescent and each one will have a different appliances and we're going to describe them so when the patient in the early mixed dentition the mid palatal suture has not fused yet and actually uh, they has minor initial bridging at all so if you apply a heavy force um you will not get any more than applying light force because the palate is an as have not fused yet and heavy force or rapid force is not needed in these cases so basically any expansion devices with um, just slow expansion light force will result in um, moving and, and breaking these sutures and open up the suture if the patient is 9 to 10 years old he's not older than 10 years old and that simply can be done using um, upper removable appliance or a quad helix appliance However, there is no evidence or any advantage of using rubbed movement or a high force. But also that the heavy or rubbed force in these patients, so these are 9 to 10 years, might result in facial distortion. So basically, you can't go and use a heavy force or a rubbed force, like an RME, for example, that we will discuss later in a patient who is younger than 10. So if a patient is younger than 10, quad helix, URA, will do the expansion, will do even skeletal expansion because the, um, the suture has, is not fused yet. Uh, when we do close expansion with the quad helix in this max dentition, it's the preferred method of doing expansion compared to any other methods. And later on when we discuss the evidence, we will see why. Um, in the fixed jack screw, which basically this one, the one we use it with the RME, uh, we can use it if we don't do a heavy force and we don't do rubbed expansion in, in I mean in the stage of the uh, mixed dentition so in the mixed dentition stage we can use in the early mixed dentition or the primary dentition patient is younger than 10 URA can use a quad helix we can use the jack screw but we should open the screw as if we are doing the slow expansion twice per week we don't do it in the rabbit expansion all right so let's see the ura now we all know the advantages of the ura the patient can wear it can take it off can brush his teeth so this is an advantage to brush the teeth however it's a disadvantage because of the patient's cooperation uh, the way we use the ura to treat a crossbite is simply that we have the expansion screw and then we split the base plate in the way we want the expansion to happen so in this photograph here as you can see that i split this um, oops, uh, the, the acrylic is split in half so once you open the expansion screw this one will go in this direction this one will go in this direction so the expansion will take place in the right side in the same amount on the left side all right so basically, this is called movement of a block of teeth, and this is one of the indication to use removable appliance. Another advantage of using removable appliance is that you can add to the removable appliance a posterior bite plane to cover the occlusal surface so that you do the seclusion. Because you know, in each case of crossbite, we need to open the bite to disseclude the teeth in order to be able to correct this crossbite. And that's easy to be done with a removable appliance. You just add a posterior bite plane. This advantage it needs the patient cooperation to wear the appliance to open the screw as well. You just need to take sure, make sure when you design a removable appliance you have you must have it retentive, because whenever the patient is opening the screw it it might fail off, so you need to have um, four retentive component, and you need to make sure that it's done properly so the appliance will not be dislodged. And also the rate of the expansion should be slow. You can't do um, rapid expansion with removable appliance. Because if you apply a rapid force, the appliance will mm -hmm. open quickly and the expansion will be go faster to the point that the appliance will not be retentive anymore. It will be kept failing off. So URA is good as a block of expansion. 
uh, it needs patient cooperation it's good for the oral hygiene because the patient can take it off it's good because of the posterior bite plane uh, to do separation between the teeth and we can modify the amount of the expansion by modifying the way we cut the base plate but the main disadvantage uh, for it that it is slower than the quad helix as we're going to see later in the evidence Another modification of the removable appliance is to use something we call it coffin spring as in the see in the photograph so it's made of 1.25 millimeter stainless steel in this dimension and you simply in order to activate it you just open this one and uh, fit it to the patient. ELSA appliance which is called expansion and labial segment alignment appliance it's ELSA so it's have an expansion screw it has a labial bow here and uh, it has um, alignment wire so basically once you do the expansion you're creating more space this spring will push the teeth uh, and which is already surrounded by this labial bow so the teeth will align in the anterior segment and you do the expansion and go to space this appliance is called ELSA appliance so successful expansion with removable appliance can take considerable time which make it less cost effective as well and that's the main advantage of the removable appliance as we're going to see in the evidence later so the other option now is to use a quad helix which is a fixed appliance which well, by the way can be fixed and removable which mainly but we mainly use it in a fixed appliance it can be prefabricated or laboratory constructed the prefabricated one is simply it comes like this it's ready made and then it is slot inside um, like a slot here the wire will be slotted inside this um, wire a slot here and it will be uh, ready to be used it's usually made by a 0.9 millimeter stainless steel now just a little bit of differential expansion can be done by um, opening and the anterior and posterior coil in differential manner how to activate this one simply before the cementation you open it half to width so basically when you you just pull these parts away from each other the band should be at the above the central fossa here and above the central fossa here we call this a half crown width which can give us the exact amount of force that we need it um, a quad helix has been seen to be able as we mentioned open the suture in a young patient when meaning by young patient patient who are in the mixed dentition or early primary dentition in the primary dentition sorry and early mixed dentition they are clean and reasonably effective and they produce as we said mixed um, skeletal and dental effect one third is dental uh, skeletal and two thirds is dental the disadvantage of the quad helix is that it leaves a print on the patient's tongue. A uh, patient will get used to it, but sometimes it becomes so that they will not adapt to it, especially if they are older. Um, a Cochrane Review Library by Agostino in 2014, they looked back into what is the best removable or fixed appliance to treat the crossbite. And what they found that um, small, low to moderate quality evidence to suggest that the quad helix appliance may be more successful than removable expansion braid at correcting the posterior crossbite. And actually, they found that it's even more quicker to correct the um, posterior crossbite by 1.5 months. So now, that's why we said that quad helix is better than removable appliance when it comes to correct the posterior crossbite. It, it is quicker it's fixed to the teeth the patient doesn't want to take it off and put it back in again however it does not have the advantage of having a posterior bite plane so we have to add this one by glass enumer to open the bite and exclude the teeth so that was using um, quad helix and removable appliance in the early mixed dentition or primary dentition to do skeletal and dental expansion however we still can use removable appliance and the quad helix in the permanent dentition or even in the late mix dentition but at that time all what we get is a dental expansion we don't get any skeletal expansion so again removable appliance and quad helix still can be used in any other stages but at that time it will give only dental expansion so the second stage is the uh, pre-adolescent or the late mix dentition 
here the suture become more and more tight and interdigitated and the sutural expansion often necessitate a little bit of heavier force compared to the previous stage and then you need to involve as many teeth as possible to get anchorage to enable to um, do opening the suture in this stage we are talking about the late mix dentition which basically the teeth are about to exfoliate especially the primary molar so sometimes we need to take the we have always to take this into consideration that sometimes when you have a mobile end you might need to postpone your treatment until the four or the five erupted so you're gonna have enough retention so as we can see here this is um rapid maxillary expansion that is bonded to the teeth uh, here is bonded type here is banded type the bonded one usually the acrylic and you use a uh, composite to cement it the composite will usually be done by etching on the labial surface and the lingual surface labial and lingual but don't on the occlusal one because you need to remove it easily if you do etch and bond with all the surrounding of the tooth and then you cure the composite it will be hard to uh, remove the remo RME while if you just etch and bond the labial and the lingual surface it will be much easier and here is a banded design usually the band will be on the six and the four but as you can see whenever you have the four has not erupted yet you can use this design to correct it the main advantage of the banded one over the sorry the bonded one over the banded one that it can control the eruption of the posterior teeth so it will prevent flaring of the palatal cusp so the whole idea in patient with a high angle and increased lower facial height if you use the banded one the teeth are free to tip and over erupt while if you use the bonded one the teeth are not under control so you kind of reduce the uh, severity of the uh, anterior open bite so now we know that we have to open the suture we need a little bit of a heavier force the question is shall we go with a rapid expansion or a slow expansion so what is the rapid expansion so basically rapid expansion you ask the patient to open the suture twice per day which is very rapid to the point that was going to happen that first the teeth will be displaced within the socket and you keep opening the suit the the expansion screw so there will be no time for these teeth to remodel and do a tooth movement so the force will be now transferred from the tooth into the bone now the bone is not very rigid it's rigid but it has re resilience it has elasticity so now what's going to happen is that the bone will bend so we'll have a bone bending and then we keep opening the screw rubbed way no time for the teeth to move and this force will be transferred to the weakest point of the maxilla which will be fractured which is the mid palatal suture and this is the whole principle of using a rubbed palatal expansion so basically it rapid activation was conceived as a way to minimize maximize the skeletal changes and minimize the dental one you keep opening the screw no time for the dental movement to happen expansion will take place now because of that because you split the suture a uh, space will appear between the two central incisors so here is exactly what is going to happen so at a here expansion screw is fitted and it's opening up opening up it b the suture is split and we can start to see a median diastema that open up now after we finish expansion usually we leave the expander where it is because we want to maintain the correction but what's going to happen in the expansion area expansion cliff that is developed already we will have a bleeding and hemorrhage and then there will be a start of fibrous tissue and then will become calcification of this part and formation of bone now this process will cause a little bit of constriction of the maxilla and here is a higher risk of relapse for that reason we have to retain uh, properly at that time and we're going to discuss this later so what's going to happen is that we did an expansion but then the two shelves there will be bleeding construction the tool shelf will try to grow back again to meet each other and for that reason if you leave just the expansion for two to three months 
will we see that the median diastema will close and the cause for that is the relapse and the fibrous the dental um, the ligament ligament fiber that are connecting these two teeth together they are stretched but they are still there so they will stretch back and bring the teeth to the original position so whenever we do a RME to do the expansion we know that once you finish you need to keep the expander in its place because as we described earlier you open the suture you split the suture bleeding is there hemorrhage is there uh, start to do the bone formation that will kind of stretch the maxilla back if there's nothing to hold the maxilla will have relapse and as you can see here in the photograph a composite is placed in the expansion screw in this photograph to prevent the uh, constriction again of the maxilla because it's a very heavy one but the thing that we need to consider that these teeth are still there I'm sorry this appliance is still there contacting these teeth so what's going to happen when the maxilla is trying to um, constrict and meet back in again because we have this expander the teeth will stay where they are as if they are mig migrating within the bone moving uh, far away and staying where they are so we get the same amount of expansion but now it's more dental than skeletal and here it comes this paragraph to explain what we call it by rapid expansion slow expansion in the patient who are in the late mixed dentition in the late mixed dentition okay so what's gonna happen now this is the expansion this is the weak and we have three colors here this one represents the total expansion skeletal and dental this one the skeletal expansion this one the dental so let's go to the rubber expansion you apply force you keep opening up the screws you go up to this side here which is the skeletal expansion so by that time you reach this point you did a lot of skeletal expansion a little bit of dental expansion this dental expansion is purely due to the displacement of the teeth we um within the socket while this one because of the splitting of the suture so what's going to happen next well bleeding is going to take place the bone will try to move back to where we started but the, we have the retainer is there the appliance is there it prevented the teeth from going back to where we started it splint it hold the teeth where they are so it will appear as if the teeth are migrated within the bone doing expansion so by the end we will reach here to this point where the increase of the dental expansion and reduction of the skeletal expansion and that will be by the 10th week and at that time most of the bone will be formed now and we will have kind of rigid fixation formed by the patient's bone that will prevent um, relapse so you can see here is a skeletal here is a skeletal so the total amount is here of the expansion that if we go with the rapid expansion so what's going to happen if we go with the slow expansion well simply the dental and the skeletal expansion will go side by side and because the bone is still soft is not too rigid at that age the suture will open and we will get a skeletal result at the uh, late mixed dentition and the late mixed dentition usually talking about 10 11 years old patient so at that age again we need a heavy force to open the suture but we don't need a rapid force to it open the suture because simply the final result that we will get is the same then here we got opening the suture they go side by side and then we get the maximum expansion we wanted but if, if they're both the same so why do we prefer the slow expansion because of the discomfort that the rapid expansion cause for the patient it cause pain periodontal damage and patients will hear a clicking and when the suture is open so we try to go for the easiest option for the patient um, so basically at this stage rapid activation of the jack screw therefore is not an uh, effective way to minimize the tooth movement the net effect is approximately equal in the skeletal and dental expansion for that reason at this stage we don't have to go for rapid expansion to open the suture so we have to go to the slow expansion which basically you open the suture one turn per day or even every other day so the maximum you open the expansion screw is once daily 
So now we have finished uh, management in the uh, late mixed dentition. Now, which is we call it sometimes pre adolescent stage. Now, what about the palatal expansion in the early permanent dentition? Now, in this stage, we know that the palate will, in, in, in the literature, is reported that it will fuse completely by the age of 4 15. So if a patient came to the clinic from the age of, if, if the patient is older than 14, then oh, it's fine. We just know that the suture are fused. But if the patient is a little bit older, a younger than 15, we need to know how much space closure or how much calcification of the, um, of the mid palatal suture has taken place. So now, as we have a lot of CBCT, and you know that the exposure dose of the CBCT is reduced, a um, new development technique developed called mid palatal sagittal uh, suture density ratio. So basically, you take a combined CT scan, you evaluate the amount of um, uh, uh, radio, opa um, radio opacity in this, uh, the gray, we call it the gray one, and this uh, radiograph, and then you give it a score from 0 to 1, which indicate the amount of the calcification that we have. So for those in the early adolescent between the age of 10 to 14, rapid expansion can be used, and the ex slow expansion cannot open the suture. So if you are Younger than 10, which is in the primary dentition, early mixed dentition, only just expansion, and that will get in a skeletal result. Then in the late mixed dentition, you don't need to go for um, rapid expansion because simply slow expansion can do the job and open the suture. That will be up to the age of 10 or 11. Then from 11 to 14, slow expansion now will not open the suture and you need a rubbed one to be able to open the suture and here it comes the removable rubbed maxillary expander the RME now as we said it used um, before the age of 15 because after that the suture will be completely closed and then once you use the RME okay the suture will they will as we said you transferring the force into the bone and the bone will split so we're going to get separation of the mid palatal suture. As we mentioned, we're going to get a little bit of bone bending when you transfer the force into the bone and buckle tipping and body movement of the teeth, that is definitely. So what does the evidence say regarding the effect of the RME? This is a systematic review published in the Korean Journal of Orthodontics in 2020 and it's titled short-term treatment effect produced by rapid maxillary expansion evaluated by computed tomography systematic review and meta-analysis what they concluded that rme produces skeletal and dental treatment effect the skeletal expansion measured at the basal bone at the first molar region is 2.2 which is fairly good so it's about two millimeter of skeletal purely skeletal expansion now the skeletal expansion of the nasomaxillary complex was greater caudally uh, maxillary uh, structure than the cranial structure. So when you do the expansion, as you go up, the amount of the expansion reduced. If you, as you go posteriorly, the amount of the expansion will be reduced as well. So different part of the maxilla will be responding in, in a different way to the force of the army. As we go up, the amount of the expansion will be reduced. As we go back and posteriorly, the amount of the expansion is reduced. And don't forget that after we do the expansion, we get about 10% of the expansion that we did as a relapse. And this is something to count for when we do the treatment. Now, dental expansion causes during the active phase of the expansion, a bucket movement of the first movement crown with the vestibular lingual inclination increased. And then during the retention period, it was observed as uh, uprightening of this inclination. So basically what's going to happen, you push the teeth out, they are flared, and then they upright themselves during the retention. From these, uh, we, 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 the evidence and the effects of the RME, we can come up with a contraindication to use them. First, uncooperative patient, and uncooperative patient is not an option for any treatment. Adult patient, we know that because that's after 14, the suture is closed, no, no chances. High angle and reduced overbite. Okay, when we do expansion, we said 
to the army we do three things opening the suture which is fine but then bone bending which will result in hanging down of the palatal cusp and expansion of the teeth which again gonna use it in hanging down of the palatal cusp so basically it will increase the facial height so army is contraindicated with a high angle and reduced overbite cases um, severely buckly tip teeth now remember that buccally tip teeth is a way of dental alveolar compensation it's the same of having excessively proclined lower incisors in a class 2 case you can't procline them more you don't want to procline them more and it's the same if we have a severely buccally tip teeth we don't need to even do expansion more and um, if we have a periodontal problem we don't have to use RME and we're going to see now late why is that um, if we have a significant true skeletal asymmetry, we know that most of our effect effects are uh, dental and it's not skeletal. So if you have a skeletal asymmetry, you can't really fix it with RME. You might be able to fix very minimal mild cases, but no, if it's significant asymmetry, no. Uh, the potential complication of the RME is that the patient will have pain and soreness and that's understandable for the amount of the heavy force applied. Periodontal damage of um, the periodontal ligament when we do the expansion and root resorption as well and vertical dimension changes in the form of that we'll have a hanging down of the palatal cusp and opening with the bite. So what are the kind of side effect of using TADS. The first, and what is the evidence saying about, saying about it? So, alveolar bone changes after rapid maxillary expansion with bone tooth bone appliance at a systematic review. So basically, you need to see what's going to happen to the bone after we do this amount of expansion. The bone that is surrounding the alveolus, not the bone where we insert the TAD. In all the considered studies, significant loss of buccal bone thickness and marginal bone level were observed in anchor teeth. So let me get this clue through uh, clear. Sorry, that when we do the expansion, the amount of uh, bone alveolar bone changes we are talking about is in the labial surface because we are pushing now the teeth out. And they found that there's significant uh, buccal bone thickness and marginal bone level uh, loss during the expansion. For that reason, you need to be very careful and sometimes it's contraindicated to use RME with a periodontally compromised patient. What about um, the root resorption? Now, when you use a periapical radiograph, you get only 2Ds of the 3D uh, structure. So it's understandable why this will diagnose um, a resorption in less uh, popular. So here it's come the CBCT and it displays statistically significant root volume loss associated with maxillary expansion theory. So yes, we have a little bit of evidence that this expansion can cause root resorption. So this is so now so far it can cause a little bit of bone resorption in the buccal side, it can cause root resorption. So the point is now don't go and use this technique until we have to. So then it's a lot of been mentioned that um, expansion with RME can help to improve um, sleep apnea, uh, breathing disorder. So where is the evidence from there? Now the first thing you need to know that there is little doubt that nasal airway and nasopharynx will a volume increased by rapid maxillary expansion. So basically when you do expand the, the maxilla, yeah, the nasal cavity will be affected. Yes, uh, the um, size and the, the volume of the nasal cavity will be increased. But the question is, is this expansion and increase in the nasal cavity will be result in better respiration of the patient or not? Because we know, okay, we did an expansion, we increased the volume, will that increase in the volume, will increase the, or make the breathing easier for the patient. However, what is important for the patient is what we call it nasal resistance. How is there's a resistance for breathing and through the uh, through the nose? So if this resistance is high, doing expansion and increase the volume will reduce the resistance. So that will help patient to kind of relieve. 
For that reason, in textbook in the Prophet, he asked this um, question, the author, does this justify routinely exam expanding those with normal palatal dimension into buccal crossbite? For those with demonstrated resistance to the nasal flow, the answer will be always yes. So if you have a patient who has a resistance for or, or, uh, for um, a nasal flow, air flow, then he's struggling with breathing, then yeah, we have to do something. We do the expansion that will increase the um, air flow, the volume of the air flow that will help the patient um, to reduce the nasal flow resistance. So does really um, the RME increase the volume of the airways? A systematic review found that uh, there seems to be an association with an increase in the nasal cavity volume in short and long term with the expansion of the palatal screw, of the rapid maxillary expansion, sorry. And there's another claims as well that if you use the RME in the narrow maxilla, you will improve the chances of uh, spontaneous eruption of a palatally impacted canine and that's what was the investigated in this systematic review which found that yes uh, it found that maxillary expansion with the situous canine extracted or prevented from mesial movement on that side will help to align the canine so yes if you do palatal ex uh, um, rabid maxillary expansion you improve the chances of the canine to come down given that given that um, you can extract or maintain the space of the uh, CU on the other side. Now here we come to the palatal expansion in the adolescent and you were talking about older than 14. We know for a fact that the suture is closed. So for that reason at that age it doesn't make any sense to go and use a rapid maxillary expander on a patient with this age because if you use the rapid maxillary expansion one of two scenarios is going to happen. Either you keep opening the screw until it's fractured, you are lucky, the screw is the suture is fractured, or you keep opening it, opening it, and the patient feel pain, discomfort, pain, discomfort, and all of a sudden he determinate the treatment because he can't tolerate the bone anymore. Um, so, but then slow expansion again it only moves the teeth but it doesn't move the suture in this stage here we can use them only when we want to move the teeth now uh, tooth supported expansion should not be attended in this stage which I mean RME um, because um, there's no point of wasting time by opening the suture trying to open it then patient feel pain so the best option in this case will be to use mini implant supported palatal expansion the marby one and use the expansion screw to open uh, the suture and again it all works for a good reason now in this age the adolescent the bone become denser and the density of bone will be good for a quality or bone quality for implant placement uh, so this is the implant supported expansion so as you can see this is a hybrid design in which the expansion screw are inserted to the palate and then soldered to the arms here as you can see patient is opening the expansion screw so that will force will be transferred directly to the bone however whenever you use this one in the tad do not you open it twice daily the maximum you can open is two millimeter per week to avoid distortion of the suture again is the palatal uh, mini implant effective or not this is a clinical trial that is done by Zong in 2020 again and when they looked at the CBCT of patients they had a Marby fitted into them there was 22 patients 11 male 11 females with a mean age of 14 plus minus 6 which means that the patient can be up to the age of 20 and all of them they have a transverse discrepancy they found that the total expansion of 5.4 plus minus 2 which is almost 7 millimeter was achieved now almost 60 percent were attributed to the skeletal expansion so most of the expansion was done uh, by skeletal expansion which is about 3.5 3.15 millimeter plus minus 1.6 which almost like 5 millimeter of a purely skeletal expansion Okay. However, we still get some dental expansion, which is about um, 2.5 millimeter of tipping of the molar. 
So yeah, skeletal expansion can uh, do the expansion, and this is a systematic review and meta analysis for skeletal expansion, and it's called that Marby is associated with the following advantage over the traditional tooth bone army: one, increase in the palatal suture opening, increase in the palatal width, reduce in the buccal tooth inclination. So yeah, that's perfect. That's good. Yeah, and I I agree with that because. This will result in a more skeletal expansion compared to the army. Not saying that the regular army doesn't work. No, it does. But uh, first, in this age, which is in the late um, in the late permanent dentition, no way the suture will open with a conventional method. It has to go to either Sarbi, which will be discussed later, or Marbi, which is the mini implant supported um, mini implant supported. Uh, I just. Uh, expansion, yeah, Marby. All right, um, but what are the effect on the all uh, airway? Do we expect if we use a uh, Marby to get more expansion? In this randomized clinical trial, they randomized the patient into hybrid design, which is um, expansion, skeletal expansion, conventional um, hyrax, and another modification of it for expansion. They found that. Um, uh, rapid maxillary expansion resulted in relatively small increase in the total uh, airways and it appear uh, com and it's uh, separate compartments with mostly no significant difference between the method you are using for the expansion here we need to discuss a little bit of other expansion methods so expansion arch so it's a very heavy arch we put it on the labial surface and you attach the teeth to it a randomized clinical trial di done by McNally in 2005 to compare it to the quad helix and we found that both appliances are equally effective and both appliances were uncomfortable for the patient to remember that these helices hit the tongue of the patient make him um, uncomfortable the other option is to use the purely the fixed appliance so basically you get uh, expanded 19 or 20 uh, 1 by 25 steel steel arch wire you do the expansion you get the help by cross elastics if you want you can place a glass anywhere to prevent occlusal interferences and here we come to the other option which is called sarbi so basically um, the suture patient is adult you need to open up the suture you can't because you know that at 15 it's closed so then what you need to do is to send the patient to the surgery he will um, do Lefort 1 osteotomy he split the suture for us and bring it back in again uh, the reason why we're using SARBI it's like we're using distraction osteogenesis so if you need to do a lot of expansion uh, the soft tissue can, it, can take it the amount of stretching will be huge so what you need to do is to just split the bone and then you do the expansion gradually we have something we call it alternate rapid maxillary expansion and constriction and this one will introduce by Lewis for the management of anterior open by for the management of sorry class 3 cases in which you need to um, move the maxilla forward so he thought if you loosen the suture it would be easier for the maxilla to move forward so his protocol is to open by one millimeter then close by one millimeter open by one millimeter and close by one millimeter uh, for seven days uh, this this technique could have a good results when they use again a face mask to treat class 3 but at the moment whenever it's only cross bite then this is not necessary so what we're going to do when we have a unilateral expansion because we know for a fact that we have a reciprocal anchorage when it comes to expansion so if you push this teeth this direction the opposite force will be in this direction equal equal in the amount opposite in the direction so if you're going to have expansion on this side we're going to have expansion on this side well this is good if we have a unilateral buc buccal cross bite with displacement which means that we need to do expansion on both sides all right um but if we have to do expansion on one side only what we can do is to modify the way we cut the acrylic so for example here we cut the acrylic in half so let's assume that i want to expand only the six so i come here i do the cut on the acrylic here so by that all these teeth are against this one that's one way to um, reinforce anchorage and um, do expansion on one side the other option is to use quad helix but then you cut the arm from here so now the six here is against six five and four 
so in these cases um, you will have more of um, expansion on this side moving it out and definitely if you have a unilateral expansion you can use um, cross elastics to fix this one so what's going to happen after we finish expansion now we're done with the expansion you need to keep the appliance in its place for three to four months minimum to allow the bone and the expansion side to uh, reorganize and then you need another appliance for six to twelve months to retain the teeth in their uh, place however when you use a dental expansion you still need a 12 months to retain this expansion now Costa did a um, systematic review to see how much time uh, do we need to wait uh, to uh, retain the expansion and he said that uh, you need at least six months and that will result in a good result if you wait for six months a few points just for retention here before we finish expansion where posterior teeth were previously tipped lingually as we mentioned dental crossbite expected to be more stable stable expansion of the lower inter canine width is unlikely as we said because his, his patient get um, uh, older it become narrower and there's a higher stability of the premolar one because as we know from the if you if from the extraction and extraction lecture if you expand uh, from the intermolar width you get um, more space and more stable results compared to the intercanine width expansion more likely to be stable in the absence of the extraction and remember we need to do over expansion whenever it's possible to overcome the relapse that we might have just a um, quick summary to to um, focus all the knowledge when you never we decide which treatment we're gonna know it depends on the age of the patient if he's in the um, mixed dentition if he's in the late in mixed dentition if he's in the early permanent dentition what is the etiology because of the you know etiology you can decide the management buckling inclination of the posterior teeth if they are excessively flared then that means that we can't do any expansion we need to go for a skeletal expansion overbite and overjet if the patient has a um, reduced overbite that means that will any expansion will worsen either the anterior open bite and uh, definitely the clinical condition of the teeth that's a rough kind of guideline for how much expansion you can go with, do with each method two to three millimeter by removal appliance four to five by quad helix four to six by rme and more expansion definitely by marby thank you very much